Honorable Member for Lac St. Anne Parkland. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, to my colleague, you're a tough act to follow, my friend, and God bless you. I love everything you said. And to the other members that have stood here today and, and talked about it, and uh, to the Premier and to the Minister uh, for my recent appointment, I will do my utmost best to serve the province and to serve the legal firearms owners uh, being appointed to the uh, Alberta Firearms Committee. So, uh, to the Minister of uh, Environment and Parks, thank you for bringing this motion forward. I know you did something similar last fall, and uh, it was really interesting that, uh, Madam Speaker, we had unanimous consent in the House. Uh, there was a division called, and every member of this Parliament stood to support the lawful use of firearms. I'm really hoping that that is a repeat, that it wasn't something that just happened once. I was on a podcast, and it's kind of a new thing for me to be invited to these, and it was a tough act to follow, again, similar to the member from uh, Airdrie Cochrane. Aaron O'Toole was on the, on the call just the, the day before I was in this podcast. And when I was regaling to the folks from Saskatchewan that actually had this on, that we managed to stand up here in the Legislative Assembly and, and agree on firearms, but when I had a motion 501 for transportation utility corridors, that we couldn't have a unanimous vote. And it was kind of their quotes were, well, it's interesting that Alberta can agree on firearms usage, but you can't agree on the tools to get your economy going. So it was kind of interesting to hear that. But I think what it did is it also spoke to the point of how important lawful use of firearms is in our province. And also the respect that we have as legislators here for the individuals that actually have you know, the privilege, if you would, with all those background checks and that meet all those requirements to, to do that. It was on May 1st when this uh, gun grab came out. Now, I'm not going to go into a bunch of statistics. I'm not going to tell you that none of it made sense. I'm not going to tell you that they took a bunch of firearms that literally were innocuous at best, that were used for hunting and sports shooting, that weren't even restricted firearms, and put them over to the prohibitive column. I'm not going to tell you about the actions of them, whether it's a bolt action or a semi-auto action, because that's been spoke ad nauseum. I'm not going to tell you about the calibers of them, the, the actual cartridges, because none of it makes sense. I was trying to explain to a colleague of mine who wasn't from the firearms community of, of why this happened. And at that point, I, after two hours of essentially trying to explain what had taken place, I put it in context. I asked what that individual's pastime was, and it was skiing. And I said, OK. Just imagine Solomon skis have all been forbidden now. You can't use Solomon skis. Well, why? Well, because they're Solomon. Yeah, but they're the same as the other skis. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It's because they're Solomon. So you pick any brand name that you want, and that is literally what took place. When you're talking about the 1,500 items that were you know, now considered prohibited, 900 of which are from the Armalite rifle, the AR-15 pattern, which has been out since the 50s. We're talking a 70-year-old piece of technology here. Now, the reason why that one is so prolific, it's essentially the Jeep of the firearms world. So there's bolt-on components being the butt stocks and being the pistol grips and all these other things. And by the way, that what, th those items are what become scary to the uninformed. So when they're talking about these assault-style weapons, there is nothing as such. What they're talking about is what somebody's seen in a movie or in a book and immediately associates with what is used for military service. And why would they get this impression, Madam Speaker? Because that's what the Liberals sent out. And their news clippings to the uninformed, and, and this is the most disingenuous thing you can do, it's the bait and switch. They literally show a soldier using a select fire rifle and then they immediately jump and say that that's what we're getting rid of. Well, who in their right mind would want that? Who in their right mind would say that having an average citizen to allow the, to have these firearms would be reasonable? No one would. And that's the insidious nature of it. Not to mention that they did this during the COVID event. And in Nova Scotia, I have relatives. I was heading or supposed to be heading down for a family reunion in Lunenburg this year. So we've got connections back in those areas. And the fact that this incident took place had nothing to do with the firearms in my cabinet, sitting in my house, that my kids also enjoy with me at the firing range, or when we go out and we go deer hunting. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with a person that had a mental state that was not allowed to have these firearms. 
three of which of the firearms were brought from the States, and arguably it could be said that the one firearm that was of Canadian source was taken from the RCMP officer. None of the things that they're proposing would have stopped this. So when I met with those individuals on May 3rd, out in my area, there was two uh, guns uh, to the, uh, um, excuse me, the uh, Canadian Historical Arms Society and the Alberta Fish and Game Association presidents, uh, two of which were, were ladies that had just taken up the sport. One lady had uh, give a very heartfelt thing of how she got into the firearms community. It was literally back in the 80s. She had said that the only way that they would get meat on the table is if their dad got that moose every year. And that same dad, given these current circumstances, wouldn't be able to use his firearm to do that because it would have made that list. I had service members there that had served over 36 years in the Canadian military now that were not deemed responsible enough citizens to be able to do what, what they do for a pastime, what they do for a hobby. We had members from the uh, firearms manufacturing community. We talk about economic diversity. These are folks that have machinist skills. They've worked in directional drilling. They've done, done a bunch of things. They started their own businesses, that, that Alberta drive, that entrepreneurial spirit. Again, coming back to that idea that you have the Jeep of the world and they're building components, either those platforms or components for them, or the other guy like from uh, EM Long Range, high caliber rifles that are designed uh, for sport shooting and reaching targets out to two miles. These fourteen dollars to $20,000 rifles that they're producing down in Leduc are no longer allowed. Or the firearms uh, the gentleman that started his own store and his own business now, and he's a young guy, he financed it himself, and he has trapped assets that he can no longer have. He can't sell them, he can't do anything. He's put his life savings and his dream on this. And overnight, because, again, of this predatorial type idea of extending rights. And what really came around the table, and, and I normally don't use notes, but I wanted to grab a couple of these, and, and some of the things that came out is, why did I serve? This is coming from the, the gentleman who's retired now. He goes, why did I serve for 36 years? Fly over to some of the worst places in the world to fight for their f rights and freedoms, to come back here and have mine taken away. Another one was from the lady who had you know, taken up the sport. She goes, how can we be treated this way? How can we be treated this way? She's a dental hygienist. She has a family. This is something that they do, and, and how can they have those rights taken away? The other one, too, was another disparaging comment was, what's becoming of our system of democracy? Again, these are fundamental freedoms, and it's not, it's not necessarily just <laughs> garnering the assets that have zero value at the end of this. And the other one was, if we don't stand up right now, who's going to stand up for the others? And what really resonated with me at that point was a time in history, and it was from uh, a Lutheran minister, and his name was Martin Emiler. Now, this poem that he wrote was out of revelation that he stood by, and he let things happen until it went too far. And I'm going to read that for you, Madam Speaker, if I may. First, they came for the communists, and I not, did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left out to speak for me. What we're seeing is, under the guise of something else to make people scared, they're literally taking away the rights and freedoms of 2.2 million people who undergo the most uh, scrutinous background checks, where you have your name ran through a database and every single day to make sure that you're okay to have it where you have to have people sign for your name every five years and be subject to that, where we willingly give up warrant and seizure rights for the privilege of owning firearms. And if we look at these 2.2 million people out of the taxpayers in Canada, well, we're looking about 8 to 11 percent, depending on the numbers. When you look on uh, how many firearms we own per capita, we're right there with the U.S. But when you look at our crime statistics, we're right down towards the bottom, Norway. Switzerland, and those type of areas. The sad fact is, taking the firearms out of my cabinet at home would not have saved those people in Nova Scotia at all. So instead of taking and finding the root cause and dealing with the main issues of that flow of firearms coming across that border, of which 80% of all gun crimes in Canada happen, instead of increasing the dollars and cents, which arguably is $86 million over five years, 
million dollars a year for Canadian Borders and Customs to do their jobs. Instead, they're proposing a spending 600 to a billion dollars to buy back firearms that would not have saved a single life. That's the scary part. What I find very difficult is that because of all these gun laws and because people get fixated on that of what they actually do, what these two tools do, we get set off to the side and, and you end up in this quagmire of conversation of trying to defend your rights and freedoms. And again, coming to that, that, to that point, if we don't speak up right now and if we don't make our voices heard, Madam Speaker, who's going to be there when the next ban comes out? And when we're talking grandfathering, it's not that I can use these firearms. They literally have to sit there. I can't take them out. I can't use them. I can't do anything with them. And by the way, when they come out in two years, they might be worth whatever they deem them to be. I can't sell them. I can't trade them. I can't do anything. Not to mention the ammunition that I have that's sitting there. So to put it in context, let's say that if by chance, uh, let's talk about motorcycles. And when I start talking to folks about that, I put it in context. Everyone loves motorcycles. There's different brands of motorcycles and there's different styles. So let's say just by chance that because the statistics shows that 18-year-old to 22-year-old males seem to be getting in the most accidents over motorcycles and they seem to be sport bikes, Madam Speaker. Anything over 600 cc's, it's now forbidden. You can't touch it. We're going to come back to you in a couple of years. Oh, and by the way, if you ride a Honda Shadow, we like that, but we don't like those Harley Davidsons because they're loud and they're noisy and they rumble. And you know those movies you watch? Only bad guys ride Harleys. Well, those are going to be parked in your garage too. How about those sports cars? How about that new C8 Corvette that everyone's been saving up for forever? They've been working hard for it. They get it. Well, we don't like mid-engine sports cars anymore. Those have to be parked. And those are the type of messages that come out when I'm reading my Facebook feeds and when I have folks coming out to me and said, I worked my back end off. I scrimped and I saved. I did these things. I put my family. I did the right things by my kids. And I went out and I bought my long-range rifle. I saved up my cash and now I can't even have that. The consultations that took place, Madam Speaker, when they went across, it was Vancouver, it was Toronto, it was Montreal. It was not rural Ontario. It was not necessarily the Maritimes. It was definitely not out west here that we like to call rural. It didn't take place. And we talk about some of these companies, Prairie Gunworks, fantastic manufacturing facility. Most of our special forces guys use their, their things, their service issues. Oh, by the way, they make a lot of hunting rifles that are the same calibers and platforms that are now forbidden. EM Precision, Alberta Tactical Rifle. There's uh, an ingenious gentleman that, that was a police officer. He became a welder and, and uh, fabricator, and then he had some health issues on that. He ended up using his hands and developing these things. Alberta Tactical Rifle, right out of Calgary. Built a bunch of these AR platforms and then developed their own. So three quarters of their work is now gone. The staff that they have on, on hand is now gone. Blackleaf Manufacturing, another you know, former oil field guy started doing this. Black Creek Labs out of Ontario. Colt Canada. A and people ask, well, why would you want to own something like that? Because they're the epitome of production. They're, they're such a high quality product now at this point. Again, 70 years of development. And again, when I pull the trigger on a semi-automatic, it's one round at a time. It isn't the death machines that they make them out to be or anything else. They didn't talk about any of that. Again, they're lying to the population to pull on the heartstrings to make them, make them empathetic for something that's not there to cover the boogeyman. It was interesting that on Parliament Hill that when two soldiers were shot and that when the individual that was obviously having some issues and some challenges that wasn't apparently illegally allowed to use a rifle used an old 1894 lever action type Winchester. Wouldn't have saved a single thing taking the Winchester out of my cabinet. But ironically, that isn't the one that they banned. They banned rifles that have not been used in these types of crimes in Canada. Even the, the Ruger um, Mini 14, it's been 30 years since Polytechnique. That variant, there's 10 variants of that rifle. Six of them say ranch right in the rifle, the ranch rifle. This isn't about doing something to fix the problem. This is that quick fix, the biggest bang for the buck to pull in the heartstrings and to take it away from law-abiding citizens. 
when the long, long gun registry came out, it was one of the biggest boondoggles. If you want to see one that's bigger, usually the sequel isn't that much better. This one's worse. <laughs> is available. I see the Honourable Member for Cardston Siksika. Madam Speaker, I was enthralled by those remarks. Control. It's unfortunate that the member uh, from Laxana Parkland was, uh, was cut off and ran out of time. I would love to hear the rest of that story and talk about sequels. The Honourable Member for Laxana Parkland. Um, I'm sorry, I missed a part of that. I have that bad left ear. But uh, what I would like to do is... You want more? Okay, here we go. So the sequel. The sequel. So the, the long gun registry was a debacle from day one. They spent over a billion of dollars on this. They had a, a bunch of folks, folks working rigorously around the clock to do nothing. Literally is what happened. And the Canadian taxpayers took it right in the rear tailgate again on that one, Madam Speaker. Now this one, it does essentially the same thing. It was such a bad plan, they decided to do it again. Now here's what's really crazy. So you got the 1,500 rifles they're talking about. Well, do you realize there's at least two more types that have came out since then? Two more rifles that I know of. Well, actually, one's a semi-automatic shotgun that was never made the list, but now the FRT, the, the actual firearms uh, registration uh, certificate that goes with it, the type rating, the Typhoon shotgun now is, is also part of that. And one of the reasons why they cited of it, Madam Speaker, it's the buttstock. So literally the part you put up against your shoulder when you're firing your weapon, your firearm, well that's bad because it's the same one that can go on all in an AR-15 or many other types of variants. And it's got this thing called a pistol grip, well that's bad too, and the forearm, the foreguard, well it looks the same. So now that one's gone. Now here's another one that hit the list, and I couldn't believe it when I talked to uh, the gun shop owner that made me, uh, that, that's in my neighborhood and, and uh, we've had lots of dialogues, he made me aware of this one. It's not one that I have in my cabinet, and I don't normally down-talk a gun, but it's a little uh, Ruger, or not a Ruger, I should say, it's a little Mossberg uh, 450T. I don't even know the model number. Essentially, it's one of the uh, least valued firearms you'd want in your cabinet. It's around $100, $120. It literally is for plinking tin cans with hardly any accuracy. And the reason why this one became, and it's a 22 caliber, so one step up from an air rifle, it became uh, foreboding because it has a pistol grip and it has a handguard and a buttstock that looks like an AR. Now the ironic part on that, it has nothing to do with the caliber, it has nothing to do with the action, it has all about appearance. So when we're going to spend all this time and effort to make how many Canadian citizens, how many Albertans, criminals, overnight. And an RCMP officer had told me, a former officer, he says, you know, he says, I served for a number of years dealing with bad guys. This isn't going to do a thing. The bad guys are always going to have guns. And what's going to happen is all the good guys will never have them again. And all you're doing is making good people into bad guys. He says, I've served all my life, been on the right side of the law, and now that I'm retired, he says, by this gun ban, by definition of it, I'm guilty until I hand over my firearms. Because again, with the long gun registry, they don't know where any of this stuff is at. So they're going to jump up and down and claim victory because they got some. They don't know how much they spent on it, where it went, and those poor Canadian Borders and Custom guys aren't getting any more cash to help them fight the bad guys, to fight the good fight. The other one that they did, which was wild, we'd mentioned that the First Nations folks are exempt from this. So you've actually put something that's literally a racist act. It's going back not just for the intent of, of sustenance, it's literally taking a demographic and setting us apart. Where have we ever done that in our, in our history of a country? Well, not on the good side of the fence, because we've progressed since then, haven't we? Or have we? So this is the way back machine. You're seeing items that are starting to take you back to a place where we should never go. If they're already admitting that these things are used for sustenance and sport shooting, then they shouldn't have been on the list in the first place. That's one of the items of the order and council. So by definition, they're even going against their own things. The fact that I can't have a nice cup of black rifle coffee anymore, because coffee beans are bad. 
And those coffee beans, Madam Speaker, were made to caffeinate the most people in the least amount of time. So they must be bad compared to nabob, which will only get several people caffeinated. But apparently these ones, you can get 600 coffee beans per minute or coffee beans per minute coming out of it. Like, you can't make this up. A website. A website now is a restricted firearm. An airsoft rifle. So airsoft rifles were developed over in Japan because they weren't allowed to have real firearms. So they had plastic shooting pellet guns. Those are bad. Oh,